started. Oh, and also Jeffrey is going to be recording this presentation today because then we post them on the website for people who would like to um, hear what's going on and they don't they don't have time today to attend in person. So I'm going to move forward to our next slide and talk about the state budget. This is of course very important for all of us and we were warned last fall to expect a 2% cut. Uh, this is the Department of Cultural Resources where the State Library resides. That would have been the third year in a row with the 2% cut, which is starts getting painful. It's painful anyway, but three years in a row is really painful. We had been talking here internally about doing a reorganization in the library portion of the State Library or the Government and Heritage Library. And so when we were told that we were going to have to take a cut, I pretty much said, mm, we're going to be so busy with our reorganization that we're not going to be able to um, put any time or energy or thought into uh, realizing a 2% cut. So. This will uh, be our, our cut because we're obviously going to have fewer staff at the end of the reorganization. That was part of the reason for the reorganization. This is a program that's offered by the state called Reorganization Through Reduction. And what it does is it allows us to keep positions at, if they are so the person retires or leaves. Usually we're having to justify every position. So this gives us unprecedented flexibility and we decided to take advantage of it. You can see that we had four staff who decided to retire voluntarily. We had seven staff who were rift, and that took effect last Friday. So we're all sort of a little shell-shocked around here, but we're getting ready to start turning our faces forward into how are we going to redeploy these positions. Um, several things are going to happen. We're going to be allowed to, we're going to move some of our positions that are currently paid with federal funding back onto state funding. And that's very important because the federal funds aren't secure. They could go away at any time. It's allowing us to um, reduce the number of departments in our government and heritage library from four to two. So we're going to mimic a lot of other libraries with uh, those two departments, one being sort of outwardly focused and facing for the patrons and involved with um, rendering services outside the walls of the library. And then the other department is going to be more inwardly focused, technical services, metadata, cataloging, and that sort of thing. We're also consolidating our administrative services. So we had six or seven different people who were all providing administration across various different departments and doing it in, in, in different ways. So we were making some mistakes and we weren't realizing some efficiencies that I think we will realize by bringing everybody into one department. So we're hopeful that we're going to go down to three employees that are going to be able to accomplish the same amount of work but just doing it in a more efficient manner. And if you've heard the governor speak, you know that efficiency is one of his big, was one of his three E's. So we're uh, interested to see if we can make that work. Another big news is the Department of Environment and Natural Resources. This is a proposal by the governor to move the outwardly facing part of the Diener Department into the Department of Cultural Resources. We already have the History Museum, the Art Museum, historic sites, the battleship. We have a lot of venues where citizens and tourists from all over can pay an admission fee and visit the whatever the uh, attraction is and learn about NC history. Well, the Department of Environment and Natural Resources also has these venues like the zoo and state parks where people can visit and learn about history or just enjoy our state. The 
proposal that the governor has put forward is to move those attractions out of Diener or the Department of Environment and Natural Resources into our department and Diener would keep the monitoring of the air quality and checking the river levels and all that kind of stuff uh, in that department. We would simply get the uh, Natural Science Museum, state parks, zoo, aquariums and other things like that. Even so, that would be about a thousand employees coming into the Department of Cultural Resources. It would about double our size. And since the State Library is not really an attraction, quote unquote, you know, we don't operate the same way that the zoo or the museums do. Um, it puts us, we're going to be a smaller, smaller little portion of the department. Now, we're very aware of that, and we always work to keep libraries and the state library at the forefront of the secretary's attention and so she's always aware of what's going on and we will continue to do that. I think that this could actually present an opportunity for increased collaboration among libraries of all types and these other divisions and departments in state government. We collaborate greatly now with the uh, archives and history, with the historic sites. We have programs at the art museum. We do things with the history museum. So this would just expand that scope for uh, collaborative projects. And I think that could be really exciting. I've already planted the seed for the zoo to give us some free passes that we could um, give to public libraries and they could check out in the summertime for people who might want to travel to Asheboro and visit the zoo. So we'll keep you posted about that. If you've got any questions, post them in the chat box and I'm going to move on to more news. So this is kind of huge, this Roots MOOC. I don't know how many of you have ever taken a MOOC or a massive open online course. But the State Library is sponsoring one on genealogy. We're working with Wake Forest University. They're providing the technology. We're providing the expertise. And the MOOC is in its third week, I believe. We have 3,500 people signed up and taking it. And it's amazing how much is going on. There's uh, very active chat boards. We have people enrolled not just from North Carolina and not just from the United States but from New Zealand and Sweden and Ireland. We've got people who are very experienced researchers who are taking the course and they're proving to be quite um, vocal advisors to the newbies who are in there. And this course is a course aimed at beginning genealogists. So. It's so interesting that we've got some of the more experienced people who are there and willing to help. We've got the, the executive director of the National Genealogical Society is enrolled. So the youngest person enrolled that we know of is a college student, a sophomore in college, and the oldest is someone who's 88 years old. So we're very excited about this. If it's really popular, we're going to um, do another one, maybe an intermediate, and it's not too late to enroll. You can catch up or at least get online and see what all the excitement's about. But we're very excited about that, and it's it's a lot of fun. I've, I'm enrolled and enjoying it. Another interesting bit of news from our Government and Heritage Library is we've got another new digital collection. So you'll recall that right around the end of last year in December, uh, of 2014, we announced the new Our State collection. So we digitized every issue of Our State magazine up to the last three years. Well, here's our next big exciting collection, and that is Wildlife in North Carolina. Uh, this is over 70 years of magazines, over 700 issues, and they're all online. There's some gorgeous photography and uh, nature photography in this magazine, and it's a resource that could be useful to all sorts of North Carolinians for all sorts of reasons. So we hope you'll get in there and check that out. Um, it's just one more fun and interesting resource in our online collections. Now, as you know, 
one part of the State Library is a library for the blind and physically handicapped, and this library provides free services to any person in the state who has problems with vision or even physical problems that make it hard for them to hold a book. The cool thing about um, this service is they're starting to enter the new century, so they're doing downloadable books for a change. This is the first time. So the BARD service, which is the Braille, ooh, I can't remember what it says, Braille and digital books um, are now having allowing patrons to download their books, Braille and audio reading download service, directly from their OPAC. We've had, in February, we had about 1,800 downloads just in North Carolina. That's about 22%. And that's actually down from uh, January with closer to 40% of people are downloading these resources. So it's really pretty cool that people can get these uh, books right in their homes. Uh, and of course, if they anybody doesn't have that capability, we're still mailing out books on tape to lots of patrons. So we rely on you all to help get the word out about this service. Uh, a small fraction of the potential audience for the Library for the Blind actually use it. Um, one hurdle for some of our patrons is that they don't want to take the, the resources away from the truly blind people. This, this library is for anyone with visual difficulties. And most of our patrons are people who have actually aged into macular de degeneration or some other reason for having impaired vision. And that's who uses this services the service the most. If you know of a patron who's beginning to uh, max out your large pr print book collection, I hope you'll suggest to them that they might want to check it out because it's available. And it's even available on a temporary basis. So if somebody is just having a temporary visual vision problem, they can sign up and use the service while that is um, um, something that they're facing. So anyway, help us get the word out about that. I'm moving on now to LSTA, and I know people are very interested in this. We've received 55 applications for grant-funded projects this year, and you can see the breakdown. The easy grant applications are a one-step process. We, we say that the application is easier, and it is. It's a little bit easier than the project application, but there are still yeah, it's a lot to do. So we've got um, all those easy grant projects. I think that's 43 or 45 applications. And then 10 of them are the project grants. And those are the ones that require a letter of intent. This is a lot of reading that the state library consultants have to do and review of all of these applications. They have done their review and senior staff here at the State Library is going to be doing their review next. And then finally the LSTA Advisory Committee will review these applications as, as well and sign off. This, uh, our advisory committees are very important to us. We couldn't do what we do without them. The two newest members of the LSTA Advisory Committee are Lynn Thompson, Director of the Southern Pines, Public Library, and Leah Dunn, who is the University Librarian at UNC Asheville. And again, we thank them for their service because they're also having to review these grant applications. Now one fun little project that we did last year with LSTA money was for public libraries, and it was a follow-up on the EDGE project. So if you're in a public library, you're familiar with that project. It's a technology planning project that allows public libraries to assess their technology services and then the assessment feeds directly into an action plan template that libraries have access to to help them decide what do they want to tackle, where do they want to work next. We made quick little $5,000 grants to 37 public libraries that had completed the EDGE 
projects and had their action plans in place. And they bought some cool stuff, including a um, table here being showcased by Sharon Stack at Kings Mountain. This is just like a giant iPad, and it's touch uh, screen, and you can move things around just by touch, and it's apparently very popular in Kings Mountain. We mm -hmm. hope to be able to offer these grants again to libraries. We are an EDGE state and we are going to be um, offering the EDGE assessment again. And you don't even, if you put a lot of effort into filling it out last year, we're not even saying that you need to do the whole thing this year. You might just do parts of the assessment or even just keep going on your action plan. So it's a we think it's a really good tool for libraries to use um, and we encourage public libraries to really think about involving themselves in that EDGE project. The E-rate closing window, it is Thursday, April 16th, so folks, we're running out of time on that. The E-rate program has undergone changes, as you know. The focus of the new one will be on broadband services, telephone and voice services, which many of our libraries do apply for, are going to be phased out uh, starting this year at 20% down and then um, continuing over the next few years until plain old telephone service is not even eligible for E-rate funding anymore. And technology plans are no longer required. Jeffrey Hamilton has created a LibGuide to help you keep up with changes to E-Rate, and there's the URL at the bottom of the page. So he's also available to advise if you find yourself in the position of wanting some advice about E-Rate. I encourage you to pick up the phone and give him a call. We're moving on now to continuing education, and we are really spending a lot of energy on continuing education. And I think I'm hearing that from the field as well. People are saying, wow, you've got a lot of classes out there. Um, one of the requests we've heard, I won't say a complaint, but one of the requests is that there is so much information about workshops on the train station that people were having difficulty finding the workshops that the state library is sponsoring. So we've added a tab on the train station and it will show you what the workshops are that are being sponsored by the state library. So you can go right there and that's that URL at the top of the page. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the things we're actually offering. Oh, I'm seeing from my notes that we're having 90 views a day on that um, on the train station. So it's a popular site for people to use. So these NC Live webinars, these are quick and lively webinars that were made in January and early February, and they're on the new NC Live resources. If you miss them, they, we do have recorded versions on our websites, and these are just one-hour webinars. I've heard Jennifer Pratt took the films on demand and said it was really fascinating. So um, I know that we're all playing catch-up to get used to these new resources, and here are, are some sessions that will help you do that. We also have full day in-person NC Live workshops. We're going to be doing 10 sessions across the state and with trainers and content specific to community colleges or public library audiences. Those will be coming. We, let's see, um, the registration for those are on the train station. The full day workshop on LibGuides version 2 will help you learn to use the new features in version 2. So this is the upgraded version or the you have to upgrade to version 2 to um, get these you know to get the benefit of these new um, features. You can see that the ones that are coming up are May 11th in Statesville, May 13th in High Point, 
May 19th in Greenville. And actually, those aren't on the screen. But if you go to the train station, you'll see all of this information. We're encouraging libraries to migrate their LibGuides from version 1 to ver version 2, because at some point, we will stop supporting version 1. Um, so again, if you want to sign up for any of these, go to the train station. May 15th, this is tomorrow in Charlotte. There's a fundraising summit, and this is looking really interesting. It's being hosted by the Charlotte Mecklenburg Foundation and Partners. Um, and then Emerging Trends. These are Toby Greenwald is getting a lot of um, attention for the, his two half-day workshops, Holistic Librarianship and Walking the Talk. So he's the Director of Digital Strategy and Technology Integration at the Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh. And he writes a blog and has a pretty good, a pretty high profile. He was a mover and shaker for Library Journal. And I know that staff here are very excited about these workshops and want to attend them. So. Um, if there's space, you can still sign up on the train station. I just want to remind you again about lynda.com and Skillsoft. These are self-paced online courses. We're providing access to these online courses to libraries this year. And we're going to be curious to see how popular and useful you find these to be. Um, Staff have viewed over 800 video segments right now at lynda.com. Some of the most popular courses that they've been looking at are Excel training, Outlook training, time management, um, Microsoft Office. So very focused, short courses. For Skillsoft, the most popular courses are Taking on a Management Role or Adobe Captivate 4. A business grammar, parts of speech, and uh, creating and populating a database in Access 2013. So that's just to give you an idea of some of the things that the types of courses that are available on these two resources. It's not a threat, but if there's not a lot of use on these, we're probably going to move away and look for another uh, resource that will better meet your needs. So if you're interested or haven't taken a look, I encourage you to do so. Our newest consultant here in library development is Amanda Johnson. And I believe she's on the, in the course today. She's working with Joyce Chapman to finalize the cleanup of the annual statistics. Uh, the draft tables are up on the website. And uh, we're looking at the cleanup now. One of Amanda's first tasks will be to update the data dashboards with the 2013-14 data. So um, I hope you get to meet Amanda um, soon. We'll try to get her out and about so people can uh, put a name with her face. And there she is. Hello, everybody. Um, so the public library statistics will be on the website at that URL at, that you can see. Youth Services. Um, this will be year two of working with the Reading Club, and that's that online management tool for recording summer reading registration and minutes read. I know this could was a little painful for some of you last year. And we sort of rolled it out at the last minute, and we're hoping people would pick it up. And, and most people did. There have been improvements that we have made ba based on the evaluations from last year. So we hope that you will use it this summer. I asked Laurie Special, why are we moving from number of books read to number of minutes read? And she said, I, and I hadn't anticipated this, but she said that um, the research really shows that if students read, or if children read in the summer, a certain number of minutes every day, and it's, in, it's ridiculously low. I don't know if it's like 10 minutes or maybe 20 minutes a day. And they do that for a certain amount of time. It becomes a habit. And so instead of people in, encouraging you know, these high schoolers to check out easy books so they can record another title read, Laurie said we're more interested in trying to build the habit in 
kids. So um, that is why we have gone to minutes, and I hope it works. The summer reading workshops have all been held by this point, and so now it's in that period of time where local libraries are planning their programs, and everybody's just gearing up for the rush. So it will be upon us before we know it. I hear something kind of cool. We've been hearing about little free libraries that are popping up all over North Carolina. So here's a picture of a little free library from um, Karen Wallace's Fontana Regional Library. And this, the man in the middle is a dentist and is a senator, a state senator. And they could not get him to come visit the library. They kept inviting him to come and see this or that or attend a program, and he, he never did. So they finally gave up, made this little free library that has this smiling mouth on the front, and they went and took the box to Senator Davis in his dentist's office. So he was very thrilled to have it. They left the box behind. They made a great connection with one of their local politicians. <clears throat> and they sent us this great photo. So Jennifer Pratt is very interested in collecting photos of little free libraries. So if you have one in your neighborhood, we hope that you'll send the picture in so we can connect them all, <clears throat> collect them all. We're thinking of putting them on a web page and so that everybody can um, share the pictures. We especially love the little mouth on here and when you can see the books through the mouth. And I guess maybe they're supposed to be the teeth. I don't know. But uh, there's just all kinds of great things about that little project. And I see Sharon Woodrow is typing. So you must have a little free library, Sharon, <clears throat> I'm assuming. Um, <coughs> Five bilingual little library. Well, that's a new wrinkle. I hadn't even thought about that. Wow. That's great. Well, this is just something that, you know, a lot of people, I'm getting ready to go to Washington, D.C. for Library Legislative Day. And so often these legislators will say, well, why do we need libraries? I don't think we need libraries anymore. We have Google. Well, this is... These little free libraries are sort of a neat idea and are very captivating. And it's the kind of thing that um, would capture the interest of a legislator. So, And especially if you've got somebody in your local area that won't come, come to the library for anything, you can always see if you can interest them in posing with a little free library, taking a picture. It could be anywhere. Um, so anyway, that's just kind of fun. Moving on, this is kind of some of the stuff that's on our radar. And some things stay on this on the radar slide longer than other things. There's the EDGE initiative, and that is, um, we've already talked about it. It's managed by the Urban Libraries Council, Library Council, and we are going to have year two of this um, statewide program. So we're in the process of purchasing a statewide subscription and at that point in time once we have it um, have done that then it will be available to public libraries I think it's a great opportunity here in year two to look at the progress that you've made individually in your library by looking at your action plan and what you've been able to check off and then by looking at all the libraries across the state we get a really good statewide snapshot so uh, I encourage you to really think about doing it. The LSTA reviewers have been impressed with the references to the EDGE survey and grant proposals. So um, many um, projects are being justified by EDGE data. You know, the EDGE data shows that we need to improve in such and so an area, and that's why we're asking for this money. That's a very compelling argument, so uh, keep that in mind, too. First search. I know you all have heard this. Um, when NC Live announced that it um, was changing its base packages effective January 1 of this year, one of the things that we dropped, that, for, that they dropped, was OCLC First Search. Uh, First Search base package, and it's also known as WorldCat Discovery. 
Well, little did we know, any of us, just how much had been loaded into that World Cat Discovery product. Uh, we bought it so many years ago that um, we just didn't realize how much it had morphed over the years. And so it became very clear after, uh, as we were getting ready, as NC Live was getting ready to drop it, that it might be very painful for some libraries, especially the libraries that have purchased WMS, the OCLC's ILS, because they were going to lose access to their own catalogs without first search. So as you can see, this, this, this product has changed mightily over the years in ways that we just did not track and were not anticipating. So uh, we know this, is, this may be painful for some libraries. And so the State Library and NC Live are working with Tim Bucknall at the Carolina Consortium to A, help people understand what this product is and what it provides, and then B, if you, for libraries that decide we just absolutely have to have it, then to work out some sort of um, consortial purchases, purchase for those libraries. And that's well underway, and in fact, it may have already happened. So we have access through NC Live um, through the end of June because they realized how much this was discombobulating things. And then um, Tim will help pick it up through the Carolina Consortium for those libraries that need to purchase it. And then what they'll do is they'll pay into a group deal and then um, it will, they'll continue to have access. Uh, I'm going to be really interested in seeing what the impact is of not having first search in the state. And I would, if you have um, <clears throat> any feedback, I'd really like to hear it. Uh, I, I, I kind of have a feeling we're not going to know how, how bad this is going to be or how not bad it's going to be until we actually go without it. So we will see. Um, the Illinois, Illinois is doing the same thing. And I was talking to the state librarian there. And she goes, well, we're trying to help libraries understand this product of what First Search is. She said, I put a helpful a document up on our website. You're welcome to use it if you like. I went and looked at it. And y'all, it was seven pages long. Seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven pages. I just think there's something wrong when it takes seven pages to, to define what your product is. So um, it, we're doing the best we can to stay on top of this and to keep you all up and abreast on it too. So this is a this is a, a developing um, pro process, I guess we'll see, and we'll have many develops um, developments after July one. That's the next big deadline. The NC Knows assessment. Um, NC Knows is our online chat box. And it has morphed and changed over the years. It's, uh, the use of the chat box has been increasing recently. We've got some pretty cool software that's working. And it actually will pop up if you're on a website, especially an NC Live website or a library website for a certain amount of time and you haven't really clicked on anything, uh, this um, software will pop a little box saying, do you need some help? So we're interested in uh, seeing what we can do with NC Knows. It's been supported for, uh, for 11 years now, maybe going on 12 with um, federal dollars. And that money is for startups and getting things started, but it is not for operational funding. So I'm interested in looking into alternatives. Um, we, we know that we have some real power users in the state, people that use it a lot. And then we've got other libraries that don't use it much at all. Um, I was just on a conference call this morning with staff at NC Live because they're very interested in this uh, chat functionality because it really helps patrons use NC Live, especially after hours or when the library is closed. So we're continuing to look at it. Um, it's not going away anytime soon. Uh, if you don't want it to go away, then encourage your patrons to use it. I think we're going to, it'll morph a little bit, but we're going to try to continue to support it and then find some new and intriguing ways to uh, pay for it. 
the Workforce Innovation Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act was passed in by Congress in Washington D.C. and it enables uh, more ways to use your workforce money on the state level, including some funding to libraries. So we're trying to figure out uh, how things are going in North Carolina. The Department of Commerce is really the home of workforce development, so everybody thinks. And so they have developed a plan. So the feds are saying if you want this new workforce money, you have to have a plan a four-year strategy for preparing an educated and skilled workforce. So the North Carolina plan has been compiled, and I hate to say it, but DCR is not listed as a partner in the plan. So we have to be in there for any money to come our way. So that's not going to happen. But we're still going to be active in working with our local workforce boards and providing workforce development services in our public libraries. So I was hopeful that we might be able to get some funding to help us do this. It's not going to happen soon, but um, I remain confident that, that we're doing good work and I think probably the way to go forward on this is to collaborate on the local level. I'm having difficulty collaborating on the state level, but I'm not giving up. So. Uh, one more thing I want to mention for public libraries, and this is pretty cool. Um, I had never really heard of the Aspen Institute, but it's, I don't know how you describe it, maybe some sort of kind of think tank or something, but they've gotten together and talked to a lot of groups and a lot of interested people about the future of public libraries. As a result of all those discussions that they had over the course of about a year, they have released a report called Rising to the Challenge, Re-Envisioning Public Libraries. And the URL will take you to an online copy. They also have a very nice little paperback version, um, but the online version is word for word exactly the same as, as the um, published version. It's it's got some interesting stories about libraries. It's got some interesting questions. And my favorite part is at the end, um, they have um, action steps. So they have a page called Conclusion and a Call to Action. And so one of their calls for action is to initiate discussions with various groups. So they have. Um, action steps, 15 action steps for library leaders. So it would be really interesting to get a bunch of library people, people in a room and discuss those. They also have 15 action steps for policymakers and 15 action steps for community. It's obvious that they feel strongly that the strength of public libraries are their reach and depth in their local communities. Um, my board, the State Library Commission, is going to be meeting next month and I'm um, referring them, I'm asking them to read the report and then to come prepared to discuss the report. And what I'm going to do is to take the 15 action steps for policymakers and have us identify three of the top action steps that they see and then break us into small groups to discuss. So what this is, it's a tool that public libraries can use to engage people in their community. You can use it with your boards, you can use it with your community groups, um, and I think people are just starting to use it. So I plan to share with the public library directors how our discussion at the State Library Commission goes, and I hope that if people use it on the local level, they will, sh they will share back too. It's just such a wonderful resource that I would hate for it to not get some use. And there's some um, interesting ideas in there, some I don't agree with, but some I do. So. Um, I did hand it out, or I, we mailed out copies to all the public library directors, and um, I hope that they will find a way to use it on their local levels. And maybe we'll discuss it at the summer meeting of the public library directors. So anyway, it's worth going to take a look at. 
And that is all of my information to share with you. So does anybody have anything they want to share or any questions that they want to ask? And Amanda and Jeffrey are here too, so it doesn't just have to be me. I don't see anybody typing. Okay. Well, I think that's it then. I appreciate you coming today, and um, I'm glad that you are interested in things. And if you have comments or want to get involved in any of these initiatives, give us a call and we'll put you to work.